What exactly are functions anyway? I'm a barely functional dev, but I won't let that stop me from providing you with an answer. Functional programming is by no means a new paradigm. The math behind it was developed in the 1930s, and some of the very first programming languages in the 50s and 60s were actually functional. Then came the dark days, years really, of imperative programming for reasons. In the last five years though, functional programming has seen a real renaissance, particularly in front-end development. There's lots of great content available to teach this rapidly expanding software community the craft of functional programming, for which I am very grateful. However, this is such a radical shift in thinking from other common programming paradigms that I believe it's important to first lay the groundwork necessary for building understanding. I've noticed a gap in other functional programming materials that I'm going to fill in with the wisdom I've collected during my experience. Often, it's assumed that devs that are new to functional programming will already understand what functions are and how to think about them. At best, you might get a dictionary style definition of what makes a function pure or some example functions, but this is missing context explaining the important philosophical background and the important mental model to use when learning functions. One common way that functions are explained is to start with our input at the top. That input is fed into our function, some magic happens, and then we get output out the other side. The danger comes in explaining the magic that connects our input to our output. One analogy that I frequently hear is that of an assembly line in a factory, and this is essentially treating our function like a machine. While this is somewhat accurate, it's also dangerous for someone new to the concept. I have an alternate approach, which is to think of a well-organized library. In here, the input tells you exactly what shelf to go to, what book to grab off of that shelf, and then what page to turn to. Then, the output is whatever's written on that page. And this might seem like a somewhat strange way to think about functions, so to help explain, I'm going to go on a very brief tangent giving some background on what functions represent mathematically. Don't worry, this is only going to be a couple of minutes, I'm going to stick to high level information and we're not going to be diving very deep. So let's start with a set here of all the valid inputs that can be fed into our function. Then we'll add a second set for all the possible output values spit out by our function. In order to build the relationship between the inputs and the outputs, the magic that we refer to in the first diagram, all we need to do is draw some arrows between them. And this will show how the two are related. You can see that in this case, the input is multiplied by two to produce the output. It's important to note that these arrows are what actually make up our function. Now, I'm going to slowly migrate from math back to computer science. The first step along this journey is to state that we're not limited to just working with numbers, which is what this notation is frequently used for. So we can think about other types of values that we care about with computers. We use things like strings, for example. So let's take an example where the input is all possible strings, and then the output is the uppercase equivalent for each of those inputs. In addition to mapping values of the same type, we can also map from one type to another. So another example here, the inputs are numbers again, but our outputs are booleans, true and false. So here we are mapping whether a number is even or not. So that means one maps to false, two maps to true, three maps to false, and so on, alternating forever. It's important to note that while it's valid to have multiple inputs that map to the same output, it would not be valid to have a single input map to multiple outputs. And this here is the reason why things like random number generators, they don't count as functions. And that's because they don't map a single output to, uh, for each single input. And so next up, let's go ahead and move on to some code. And in this case, we'll take the function that we used in our first example. This one takes in a number and then returns that number multiplied by two. We can call this with various values and we'll retrieve the results. This is relatively straightforward. It's the code equivalent of thinking of our function as a machine that does things. But how would we think of our code in terms of the other approach where we want to map from input to output instead. 
Well, one way we could do that is with an object. In this case, the keys in that object are our inputs. That would be the x in our function on the left-hand side. The value is the result of what would be returned if we were to have called the function. This builds a lookup table of all of our mappings, so we can use it similarly to the function on the left, but instead of calling it, we just perform a lookup and we immediately get the result. So this means that this mapping here basically is our library. This where the input tells us exactly which one of these books we want to open and what page to turn to, and then gives us our output. This is important for understanding pure functions with no side effects because this representation severely limits what we can do in a good way. So there's no code that actually executes when we use the mapping, and that means that we are able to pre-compute all of the values. It also guarantees that we will always get the same value for each of the inputs like we have in the arrows of our set representation. And because we need to treat this as if we already know all of the values ahead of time, that means that time is no longer a factor. And if time is no longer a factor, that means it doesn't matter when the function is called. And if it doesn't matter when it's called, then we can't have race conditions. So code that uses this style avoids a whole host of concurrency problems, but that's not all. This also gives us more control and automation over how we want to optimize code execution. So for example, normally this isn't the actual representation that the machine would use for execution, but this is more of how humans would think about it. However, if you can imagine that it were expensive to compute the result of our function, then the machine could potentially keep a cache of these results very similar to how we have our mapping and we wouldn't have to worry about when to invalidate the cache because the mapping always holds true. Another possibility is if the input to the function is known ahead of time, then it's possible to run a transformation on the code and replace all the calls to the function with the result since that's already known. It's important to note that these optimizations and more can happen automatically just by treating functions like functions. These are the fundamentals of functions that I wish I had learned when I was first starting out with functional programming. But what do you think? Have I left out anything you would have liked to know? Also, what other functional programming topics would you like to learn more about? Leave a comment below or send me a tweet at OKWolf.